Hi, good morning, uh, everybody in Victoria. We're happy to have you. It's midday here in uh, Ontario, although it's a bit of a, a dark day, I would say, not to, not the sunniest day. I, I'm hoping that uh, Mayor Helps is going to talk to us about spring, because I understand spring is actually happening in British Columbia. We had a blizzard here yesterday, so not so much in uh, Ontario. And uh, we have participants joining us from around the country. We're delighted to have you. I'm Mary Rowe. I'm the president of the Canadian Urban Institute. And this is City Talk. Um, these are conversations that we've been convening for the last three weeks to try to make sense of what the impact of COVID is on our very aspects of our various aspects of urban life, what it is now, what are the impacts, and then how are practitioners experiencing it uh, in their particular domains? And then how do they anticipate the next few months what kinds of changes do they see? And then over longer term, what kinds of uh, things do they anticipate? Um, um, see you guys in the connective tissue business. We're really about how do we share learnings and best practices and wisdom and insight across uh, urban environments across the country. We do vertical quite well here. The municipalities relate to provinces, relate to the federal government. Uh, we don't do horizontal that well. Uh, so that's what CUI is about, is trying to stitch together this kind of narrative. And these are candid conversations that we have. Uh, and this time today, we're very fortunate to have the mayor with us. Um, I, uh, uh, CUI is broadcasting initially from originating here from Toronto, which is um, the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit the Anishinaabeg and the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee uh, and the Wendat peoples. But it's now home to many, many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people from across Turtle Island. And we're also in Toronto. Uh, Toronto is covered by the Treaty 13, which was signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit uh, and the Williams Treaties were signed with multiple Anishinaabeg nations. And we are aware of that heritage and cognizant of it. Um, and I've got to say, I've learned a lot about uh, uh, local approaches to truth and reconciliation from the mayor we have with us today. And I'm sure she'll talk a bit about that because Victoria, again, has been on the forefront of what reconciliation looks like in an urban context. Uh, these conversations are really grounded in the practical. We're trying to avoid taking space to just ramble on about what we think might be ahead. We're trying to not play that. Uh, but we are uh, very aware that there are still are thousands and thousands and thousands of Canadians engaged in frontline emergency service work. And this convers these conversations are in no way intended to supplant that or impede that. Um, uh, all of CUI's work since COVID has been grounded in uh, trying to be uh, helpful and supportive of what people on the front lines are doing. And in fact, uh, we put up uh, uh, two uh, interactive uh, platforms to try to share knowledge, one called citywatchcanada.ca and a second called citysharecanada.ca. This is the third, citytalkcanada.ca. And these are all powered by volunteers and partners from across the country. If you've got bandwidth to help us in terms of populating these sites so that we can learn from each other and know what's going on, please email us at covidresponse at canherb.org, covidresponse at canherb.org, and join our merry band of travelers here who are taking a half hour, an hour a day to watch what's going on in cities. And one of the cities that we've been watching is Victoria. And so we're very, very pleased to have Mayor Lisa Helps with us. Uh, Lisa's gonna tell us about what she's seeing and then we're gonna have a, a broad conversation about uh, the challenges that, that Victoria has been facing and what, they're, what they've been facing through this crisis and what they anticipate, what, what Lisa anticipates uh, going forward. Um, this is a conversation that is taking place between us and then we'll post the video online uh, subsequently, but there's a chat function here, as uh, some of you are already identifying, and uh, you can learn more about Lisa and her background if you go to the chat function, because we'll put a link up there to her bio. Uh, but also you can ask questions, you can uh, engage in a conversation if you'd like uh, with each other, uh, or you can post something directly to the mayor and uh, I will make sure she sees it and we'll have a conversation about that. Um, the chat function stays open a bit after we adjourn. We adjourn sharply an hour later, but uh, that stays open a bit more. So if you want to share uh, thoughts and participants want to continue to dialogue, feel free to do so. And we also uh, make public the chat. So as they say, uh, what stays in Vegas actually in this case, what goes on the chat is in the chat. So uh, just keep that in mind uh, that uh, what you say is there visible and history. History will record it. Um, and so we are recording, obviously. 
and we use the Twitter hashtag, uh, hashtag city talk and really want this to just be the beginning of a conversation. So it's sort of been an all hands on deck moment and uh, boy oh boy, uh, have cities been on the front lines of this. I, I've been saying to the media that have been asking me that cities have functionally been the first line of response uh, where the rubber really hits the road. All the things that cities were challenged by before COVID are now really challenging them. And we're really eager to hear from you, your worship, about what you've been experiencing in Victoria. So why don't you just lay the groundwork for us a little bit and tell us um, what, what's Victoria's experience been through this last five weeks of, and actually the last time, I, just before COVID, I was with you in Victoria. We were at a conference together and I, I, you and I had a coffee together and then I flew back here and uh, boy, the world changed, eh? So, it sure did. So yeah. tell me, tell us what's happening, please. We're happy to have you. Sure, thanks, Mary. Just uh, you may um, call mayors in in uh, Ontario your worship, but we uh, in Victoria, we, mayor helps is fine, or Lisa. So no, no, we we've outlawed your worship. Um, I, I want to begin by uh, by acknowledging where where I am this morning and where the city of Victoria is, which are on the uh, the lands of the Lekwungen speaking people, uh, the Songhees and the Esquimalt nations. And I'm struck uh, always, but particularly through this time, by their ongoing generosity. Uh, for welcoming those of us who are more recent uh, visitors here. So I, I just wanted to, to acknowledge that and, and to thank them. Um, yeah, it's been a wild ride. It, it seems like five years ago that you were here for the Sustainable Development uh, Goals in Cities Conference, which was just March 10th and 11th. That was, uh, and, and interestingly, that day I was literally supposed to follow you back to Ontario and make my way to Ottawa. Uh, I was at the airport uh, and my staff said, <laughs> Oh no. I don't know where that's coming from. That's but we'll see. Stu is I don't know what that is. Maybe we'll see if the we'll see if the tech team can figure out where that noise is coming okay. from. It's not it sounds as Great. if it's been stopped. Okay, keep going. Go ahead, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yeah, and since that day that I didn't get on that plane, um, life has been very, very different here uh, than, than it has uh, in the past, and, and that's uh, the case for, for across the country. So the first kinds of things we had to grapple with were uh, how do we uh, continue to function? So we closed City Hall, we closed our recreation centers, um, which are services, particularly our swimming pool. Uh, it's in a low-income neighborhood. People depend on that. They depend on yeah. that for their well-being, their community connection. So um, that was that was a, those were the immediate concerns, kind of locking down, if you will, uh, and then figuring out how do we continue to deliver the services that people count on in a way that has the appropriate physical distancing. Uh, who do we need to lay off or not lay off? Uh, and then uh, what about all of our businesses who are close? So I mean, the, the same things that have happened um, in, in every city ha have happened here. And I guess the approach that we've taken is for the most part, uh, we're all in this together. So the moment um, businesses started to close, I convened a call with business leaders and we've been meeting twice weekly since then. Uh, and it's not, how are we gonna recover? It's what do you need right now and how can we help? Uh, and so too with uh, kind of the other side of the coin, uh, when, when the prime minister says repeatedly stay at home uh, and people start to do that, you really see who can't. Uh, and those are the people who don't have homes who are living on the streets. And so I would say um, we've, we've had a three pronged, uh, my time has been spent in three ways. Um, one is uh, working with our business community two is working on homelessness, and then three is just working and connecting with residents uh, through our neighborhoods team and, and others to make sure that they have what they need to, to stay safe and stay connected. So that's that's a high level overview. Uh, happy to dive into any of those different trains. Yeah, well, and I should encourage people on the chat if they want to ask particular questions, by all means do. Um, and also on that toggle switch, if you could direct your chat, you'll see there's a choice. You can send it to all panelists or to everyone. So please send it to everyone since it's just one panelist uh, and everyone will want to hear what you're asking. Um, so interesting for, for us, I think, you know, Victoria is quite a small city relatively, right? But, but you are on the vanguard of a lot of things, even before COVID, you know, you're coastal, you have, uh, you have a really permeable border with the United States because people come in on that ferry. Um, you're, uh, you have a marine uh, orientation, obviously uh, uh, to the ocean. 
Um, and then you have a really vibrant local economy. And then you also have a vibrant tourism economy. And you have the provincial state, uh, the, the provincial legislature in Victoria. So you've got a lot of government jobs, but you've also got this uh, other thing. And I know you have an emerging tech sector as well. So you're, you're, it, you're kind of a microcosm, I think, of a whole bunch of challenges. And as you just suggested, homelessness, uh, which uh, is part of the Western uh, sort of uh, Western seaboard kind of experience, LA, San Francisco, you, Victoria, you attract a certain larger population of folks. Eh? So do you want to, how do you want to talk about it first? Let's, let's talk about the vulnerable population piece, can we? Um, sure. Uh, talk to us about what you've been seeing, and, and you just suggested that you've been responding in particular ways. I know you've, you've got some hotel rooms and things. Are there particular things that you've been having to, you know, really zero in on around that, that population? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're zeroing in on trying to get everybody inside. Um, the situation here, again, is very similar to, it, to what it is in other cities across the country. When social distancing measures were put in place, uh, existing shelters had to cut their capacity in half uh, and some closed. And so that was, that was just disastrous. R right away, people were literally put back out onto the street. Uh, with with nowhere to go, with no showers, with no porta potties, with no I mean basic service, and so that was really the first uh, the first thing we had to grapple with. There, there's an area of town uh, on Pandora Street, which is actually just up a couple blocks from City Hall. There's there's a shelter there as well as a safe consumption site. So that was a natural place for people to start to flock to. Uh, and then our, our chief medical health officer at Island Health said, uh, this is too many people too close together, find another option. So then we scrambled to open up uh, another park as an outdoor a temporary sheltering area. Uh, our, our staff went in and, and painted, spray painted on the, uh, on the grass um, a grid. And then I've got beautiful uh, pictures of our city staff actually setting up tents and cots for people. It, it was, you know, again, no one should be outside in the middle of a health pandemic, but but uh, our staff, you know, <laughs> repurposed their their work very quickly to to do that, um, and so, so that. Can you, so can you just take us through sequentially how that happened again? I hear you, I and mean, we'd love to see those photographs. If someone can share them, we'll put them up. Um, just in terms of the decision making, the sequence of decision making. So who makes the decision that shelters have to immediately change their capacity so that all of a sudden people are out in the street? Who takes that decision? That's a great question. So that those guidelines were given by our provincial health officer, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry, and she didn't say shelters have to close or cut their capacity in half. But as soon as the six foot rule came into place, uh, no, no gatherings larger than 50 people, all of those kinds of things, the, the logical step was um, we have too many people in this church basement, essentially. We have too many people in this community hall. Uh, and again, it's an it's an emergency situation, and so I, I think the, the 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 lessons learned uh, coming out of this will be uh, phenomenal because it's it's a great question. So that decision was just kind of made uh, one at a time by shelter providers, and then then everybody else is left scrambling. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, so and you so had I to think and you had to you've had to improvise. I, I'm interested that I mean you had weather that was permissible. That I mean here when this all happened, it was still minus whatever. It was very it was cold, so it was harder perhaps to consider these options, but, and the other point you meant though is that you had to redeploy municipal staff to all of a sudden become people that can put tents up, right? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that can put tents up and, and our, our staff are also cleaning the showers because of, uh, of cleaning protocols. So they're at the Our Place shelter, uh, they, they didn't have enough staff. And so municipal staff go in uh, every, after every shower they go and they spray the shower area down. And I've got some fantastic pictures of that too. I mean. Our, our staff yeah. have really come through it in a big way. But so, that, so that's where we are now. We essentially have between 350 and 400 people camped outside in two separate areas. Um, there are, you know, there are showers now and hand washing and, and food being delivered, but it's, it's still, uh, it, it, you know, especially uh, Topaz Park, it feels like a place that you'd see in a country other than Canada, yeah. uh, completely unacceptable. And so we've been working very, very hard. I, I you know, basically um, every every waking hour is spent on on this uh, vulnerable population um, issue uh, with Island Health and BC Housing 
to push the province to rent or acquire or you know however they need to uh, hotels and or other indoor spaces to get people inside so we're we're awaiting a big uh, announcement very soon from the province uh, and it can't come soon enough so I, that's I mean again the you and I are going to repeat this again and again and again the need for this uh, uh, intergovernmental coordination because whose job is it whose responsibility is it so where so just very practically where'd the tents come from Whose tents uh, well, uh, somebody actually just said on the chat function, I heard many tents were donated by Victoria residents. So that's true. Uh, yeah, wow. some were donated, some were donated by Victoria residents. Uh, some were purchased um, through the, uh, our emergency operations center. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the outpouring of generosity has been, has been incredible. Uh, at, the, at the Topaz Park encampment in particular, there are uh, over 30 community volunteers who are going and handing out food. Like, there, there's a food, actually, that's something I really want to tell you about our Boxes of Hope program, but we'll save that for, that can go in the business section if you want. Uh, but community volunteers who are there helping. Um, but, but even still, uh, it's, it's the most marginalized people, once again, who are left outside. Uh, we've had more opioid overdose deaths in Victoria during this pandemic than we have had deaths for COVID on all of Vancouver Island. And that is say, not- Say acceptable. that again. Say that again. Yeah, it's a startling statistic, Mary. Uh, during this pandemic, these last five weeks, we've had more overdose deaths just in the city of Victoria than we have had entire deaths from COVID on the entire island. Oh my gosh. Wow, somebody's going to tweet that out. That's a staggering statistic. I mean, it sort of it, it 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 confirms what we're all anecdotally reporting, which is that the those that were most vulnerable going in, I have become the most victimized as we've been taking care dealing with this, right? Absolutely. Um, as you say, and all the all the weaknesses in the system. What about the indigenous? The, what's going on with the indigenous community in terms of? Because uh, you guys have been way ahead on this in terms of what reconciliation actually looks like. Um, are they disproportionately represented in that homeless population or not? Yes. Yes, they are. They're disproportionately represented. Um, again, I don't want to get out ahead of the province, but uh, there's there's a, a, an exciting um, announcement program uh, that's being implemented. It will actually be open as of tomorrow. Uh, to, to service Indigenous women who are disproportionately, disproportionately uh, represented in that population and, and the most, most vulnerable. Um, so, yes, um, we, we have a fantastic organization here called the Aboriginal Coalition to End Homelessness. Uh, and there's also uh, an Indigenous uh, harm reduction team that's out there on the street. So one of the things that we've learned through our reconciliation work uh, over the past four years is the importance of culturally uh, appropriate harm reduction, cult culturally appropriate and supportive housing. So uh, I would say that, the, that we're, you know, I don't want to say we're well in hand because people right now as we're sitting here are still outside but uh, i think with the aboriginal coalition to end homelessness and their tremendous leadership uh, they know what's needed and they're getting the resources very soon to be able to implement that again this is one of these larger lessons i think is that people on the ground actually know what's needed right and Absolutely. how I think it's such a difficult thing. You have something that is an international crisis and it cascades down where you need national leadership and then you need provincial leadership. And in fact, it's people on the ground that actually know where the money is needed and how it can be best deployed. It's part of the larger conversation you and I can have about powers to cities. Let's have that later in the hour, but okay. okay. So, um, cause one of your favorite topics I know. So let's, let's leave that for a second. Although I do want to ask you a question about safe consumption sites. So, um, I know this is controversial, you know, could, could you, how do you make safe consumption safe in the era of a pandemic? I mean, how, how have they, what have they had to do? Yeah, that, that is, that is a great question. Um, we've got an amazing team of docs and nurses here uh, who are very involved uh, on the front lines uh, with this question. So, so too with social distancing. I mean, you know, the, we could never have anticipated no one could have anticipated this but the safe consumption site for all intents and purposes had to close their chill out room which is where people go uh after they've consumed to to well chill out and and just have a bit of safe space uh and then uh the injection site itself there were the, the quarters were too close uh again according to social distancing protocols so mm -hmm. that got closed down and they began a mobile uh operation um which again is is very difficult um, so at both Topaz uh, Park and, and the Pandora uh, camp, there are, uh, there's, there's safe consumption, um, but it's, it's not the same kind of indoor supervised consumption 
Um, and, you know, and, and everybody is doing their best. The docs and nurses are doing their best. The service providers are doing their best. But, but what it reveals, and you touched on this earlier, and I, I wanted to come back to it, is this pandemic has laid bare the vulnerability uh, in Canadian society. And I think that that is a really, really powerful opportunity to uh, rebuild things a little bit differently. Have you had, a, have you had uh, uh, in incidences in long-term care facilities or nursing homes in Victoria? Have you had an Not outbreak? on the island. Not on, no, on the island. No outbreaks. Yeah, no outbreaks in, in nursing homes on the island. No, we've been very, very lucky here. Yeah. Yeah, because of course that's a, that's a larger conversation that's going to have to happen across the country about how we have concentrations of vulnerable people in certain circumstances. I mean, we've had an ongoing battle here, a battle enlivened conversation about what the future of density is. And uh, Victoria has pockets of density, but but they don't have as the intense density that some uh, certainly Toronto has. Um, and you know, good density and bad density. Okay, let's talk about businesses then, because your economy is complete, is dependent on a whole bunch of things that involve people coming in and out of Victoria. I mean, what's your annual uh, intake of tourists and visitors to Victoria generally? But somewhere, but I don't have the exact statistics, but somewhere between, I'm trying to count who comes in from everywhere, somewhere between two and three million people, probably closer yeah. to three million people. Yeah, wow. and there'll be, there'll be zero people this year. Yeah, so what is that? So talk to me about, let's talk immediately about the impacts that your local business communities have been having and your retailers. And then we'll talk a little bit about what are you anticipating, for, how are they anticipating recovering? So just give us the lay of the land. You said you were meeting with folks twice a week, I think you suggested. Twice a week. Yeah, yeah, twice a week I meet uh, all together so that we're not, you know, what did you talk about? Uh, the, the stitching together rather than verticality. So on the call, we've got um, the Chamber of Commerce, Think Local Victoria, the Downtown Victoria Business Association, Community Microlending, uh, and then a few retailers, a few landowners, just so we have kind of a smattering of people. Oh, oh and also the Urban uh, Development Institute. So basically anyone involved in either um, owning buildings or renting uh, buildings, uh, as well as the people who advocate for business. So the, uh, the, the business community here has been tremendous. Um, those who didn't have to shut down uh, early on did uh, in order to uh, help with community safety and, and flattening the curve. Um, and there's been a, a tremendous outpouring of support and, and it's not surprising, right? They're all entrepreneurs and, and creativity. So there's, um, there's an initiative that was put together. So our largest industry isn't actually tourism, it's tech. Uh, tech is uh, about $5 billion a year here. And so the, the local, yeah, it's, it's bigger than tourism. Uh, and so the, the local tech industry stepped up in a big way. 70 tech companies came together and uh, put together an initiative. And I, 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 there's so many YYJ initiatives right now. I can't keep track of which hashtag is which, but uh, tech companies uh, came together and said to local uh, retailers and uh, restaurants, let us help you get online as soon as possible. So there was this massive movement to create online stores, online delivery. And, and you know, there's one retailer she's got, she owns three stores. She got all three stores online. She's now making a thousand dollars a day and that which is you know peanuts compared to her regular revenue but that's enough for her to be able to pay her may first rent so that that uh, creativity by the tech sector and it's all you know in kind donations of tech folks helping retail and restaurant get online so that's been tremendous uh, another initiative uh, that uh, think local victoria came up with or think local first uh, is they've partnered with van city uh, and shopify uh, to create a gift card program so people can buy, I think there are close to 150 uh, businesses registered right now. You can you go on, you can buy a gift card at your favorite business. Van City covers the, uh, the transaction cost and Shopify donated the platform. And so every single dollar that you buy for, you know, goes directly into the pockets of businesses. Uh, so those are just two initiatives. Oh, and the, the third one I want to tell you about, which again, this is the one I feel kind of most proud of. I, I always like things when they can serve more than one function. Uh, so we've created a program here called Boxes of Hope, and uh, it's a it's a program. That you, I'll I'll put the link in the chat function um, in, in a moment. But uh, it's uh, led by the the Coalition of uh, to End Homelessness and local restaurants. And so the, all these people living in camps are getting three hot meals a day uh, from local restaurants. Uh, the money has come in initially from donations. So people donate $10. That $10 goes to uh, buy a meal from a local restaurant, gets delivered to the camp. Um, the, the, 
kitchens are bustling, the staff are still employed. I, I, I saw one of the guys, uh, you know, driving his his pickup truck with all these boxes of of food um, packaged for people. So so the, the the creativity has been absolutely amazing, and that makes me think there are people struggling. Obviously, there are a lot of retailers closed. Uh, but, but I, I feel optimistic that we're going to get through this and, and come out stronger because it, it's, it, that's what's happening right in the middle of this in our business. So, so what about, what about conventions? And, you know, you've got, you've got one of the great, great hotels of the world in Victoria and which has a huge convention center attached to it that I think you own and uh, you have a lot of, and then you have cruise ships and all that kind of stuff. Like what, what's your sense of how you're going to make up that, difference what's happening to the fairmont what are they saying uh, well the fairmont closed the fairmont was one of the first hotels to close so uh, they're closed, closed entirely yeah convention centers closed um we're down about two million dollars in revenue there the the good news is uh is that we haven't lost any conventions they've just rebooked for the future so our staff have done great work uh, con convincing people that that this you know things will get better and and please rebook your conference, but yeah, our 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 tourism uh, industry and the the retailers and others who depend on it, this is going to be a very very difficult summer, very difficult summer, yeah. and and not only are tourists not coming, but there aren't going to be you know there won't be jazz fest, there won't be pride, there won't be all of these things that break, there won't be car free day that brings fifty thousand people into our downtown, yeah. so yeah. that's that's the real challenge. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm interested in the, the uh, you know, I have, as you know, I lived in New Orleans for five years after Katrina and I'm in contact with my former colleagues that live there now. And of course that's a city completely organized around festivals and street life and celebrating in, in situ and all of that has been canceled. And not only is it a loss of revenue, it's a loss of cultural expression, right? It, it, cuts to the heart of a lot of what absolutely yeah i mean yeah, i wonder victoria, if, go ahead yeah victoria in victoria in the summer we are a festival city yeah. every every weekend there there is something they're free they're family oriented so there's actually a question that relates to this in the chat so somebody asked uh how is the city maintaining connections with residents including engagement efforts uh, it's not directly related to festivals but that is really really important um and so it, could we talk about that a little bit Go, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, I, we saw that you've taken your, I mean, you're still doing development proposals. You've got some kind of online capacity to review development proposals. I saw that it's in City Watch. So you're somehow keeping some business going, but talk to us about how you're engaging folks. So yeah, I'll, I'll talk about development in, in a moment, but the first thing, and, and actually this was inspired probably because one of the last people I saw before the pandemic was you, uh, and, and we talked about neighborhoods and the importance of, of local neighborhoods. So uh, our neighborhoods team uh, right away, as soon as the pandemic hit, repurposed their page on the website with a whole bunch of resources from, uh, from across uh, the country and around the world uh, in terms of um, how, uh, you know, how can people stay connected there, kind of, and focused really on, on, on human connection and, and well-being. So that's one, one thing. Uh, I heard recently that our neighborhood associations have begun to meet again uh, by Zoom or some other means. And each, um, each neighborhood in the city has a staff person, a city staff person who's assigned to be its liaison. And so the staff members are attending those meetings, finding out what do neighborhoods need. Uh, one of the programs that we had launched, uh, thankfully, just before COVID started was a program called City Champions, or maybe it's called Community Champions. Um, maybe, I, I think Alison Ashcroft is on the, the thread here, so maybe she knows if it's she called She can correct you. We'll see if yeah, she, she can correct me. Alison, is it a city champion or a community champion? We'll wait for you to tell us. Okay. You can I, keep going there. Someone can Google. Anyway, and so it's it's based on a number of other programs that we've run over the years, but it's really meant to uh, be basically city school. How do we uh, empower people to be leaders in their own neighborhoods? And and, it, and it's tar there were bursaries for you no know, one has to pay if they can't. And it's it's a tremendous program. Regular citizens uh, is kind of schooled in how do you build community, how do you build connection, uh, and. Uh, that program has now turned fully uh, online, so they're they're still meeting. Uh, and uh, it, rather than all day, it was I think it was all day Saturdays. They're they're broken into shorter sessions, and so this is amazing because these people uh, were already engaged, and now they're they're redeploying their their efforts and, and focusing some of their community projects on COVID nineteen response. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I think this this program again it's a it's a brainchild of our neighborhoods team, but uh, it it has the potential to be transformational. And I'm so glad it started before COVID because they just had to adjust uh, and get it online. Yeah, we'll, again, we'll post this in the report that, you know, there's summary that we put up online after we're done. But as, as, you, as you're illustrating, all sorts of interesting, innovative stuff is going to pop up here. I mean, some of it was, as you suggested, pre-COVID, but then it gets accelerated because all of a sudden you've got the, the need is even greater. I, I don't know if you heard that we had yesterday, we did one of these city talks and we had hundreds of people on across the country talking about libraries. Yeah. And your Maureen was on. Isn't and, she amazing? She's fantastic, and yes. uh, and we were really, uh, you know, there is an example of a civic institution that has such a rich history, uh, and is grounded in place. There is a place called a library, but now there are services that libraries provide, and we we really had a kind of uh, a, a really a really good briefing from the group on that on that um, chat that show about how librarians now are actually in the connection business. So uh, one of them talked about having, they realized they had 10,000 card holders that were over the age of 75. And so the staff and volunteers wanted to just call them to see if those folks in that demographic knew how to turn into it, you know, use the service digitally. And what they realized is that those people didn't just want to talk about digital services, they actually just wanted to talk. Yeah. So now those yeah. librarians are now calling those folks once a week just to have a visit. Yeah. And you think, wow, like that's a, concrete example of how we're all we're kind of all in the connection business now we are all in the connection business absolutely uh, every day uh, in, in terms of uh, going back to engagement one of the things i've been doing every day uh, except on the weekends for the last four weeks uh, is a daily facebook live so we broadcast huh. here uh from city hall and i share um relevant news from the federal government the provincial government things that you know impact our residents and our businesses i share news from city hall and then at the end of uh, each uh Facebook live session, we we look into the community to see what's happening there. And we've been, they, so we share, we call it news from the community and just amazing connection initiatives that there's one that we promoted, I think yesterday or the day before it's, it's called Well and Truly Gray. Uh, it's a connection website. <laughs> I know. Great. We, we um, have it up, we have it up on citysharecanada.ca and I thought okay. only, only in Victoria would they name it Well and Truly Gray. Well and Truly Gray. So yeah, it was a, an initiative created for seniors by seniors and uh, on my on my website, which I've also been updating every day with these, uh, you know, we do a YouTube video of the talk and then it goes on there. I put the little banner of their website because there's a whole bunch of seniors sitting on a bench. One is knitting, but the rest are on their cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you're, yeah, well, I know. I mean, seniors aren't what they, uh, as somebody who's you know, probably pushing in on a senior category, you know, seniors aren't what they used to be, let's just say. Um, but I just, just want to go back and suggest this notion that, as you suggested, that there's a whole lot of really smart granular stuff that's starting to percolate up. I mean, it's always been there, but now we're going to really see it through this. And uh, whenever I talk to someone who's discouraged about what the pandemic is doing and they're disheartened, I always say, just, just spend half an hour on citysharecanada.ca and look at all the, there are hundreds of examples of how communities are responding, businesses, institutions, neighborhood groups. And I scanned through, before you and I chatted, I scanned through what was being, what was posted, again, posted by volunteers, like your very own Alison Ashcroft, who's been stellar, stellar partner to us. Um, and it just is inspiring what people are coming up with, you know, and, and, and I think that's one of the challenges we're going to have now is how do we then take some of that stuff and is it, the phrase yesterday, is it sticky? Are there ways that we're gonna now institutionally need to support that? So as you suggest, even the notion of safe consumption sites going mobile, uh, I heard with the library gang, you know, they're now taking all their services out to people. And are there larger implications? So one I wanna ask you about is streets. Um, you've been doing some interesting things with streets. You've eliminated parking, right? And uh, so in certain streets so that there's more room to walk. So talk to us about that. How, how did you come up with that stuff? That's just our transportation staff, and it's in response to what residents want. So uh, Beacon Hill Park, which is our largest park uh, in the city, uh, is closed to car traffic now on the weekends uh, to give people more space for, for physical distancing and to get out for walks. Um, going neighborhood by neighborhood, actually starting with the neighborhood with the highest concentration of seniors, which is James Bay. Um, starting yesterday, we've removed some parking and created more space for pedestrians. And then our, our staff are taking a really thoughtful approach going uh, neighborhood by neighborhood 
neighborhood to see where is pedestrian congestion happening and what do we need to do uh, in order to alleviate it. Um, so that's, yeah, in response to, to neighbors and and just, just for people on the chat who are asking, Elizabeth Jans Jessen wants to know more about, Jessen wants to know more about seniors. Go to citysharecanada.ca and just do the toggle switch for seniors. You'll see a ton of stuff. And the one that Lisa just mentioned is well and truly gray. And it's uh, really, uh, it, uh, Elizabeth, it's really well and truly gray, well and truly gray.com. That's the URL that they chose. So, uh, and you'll see the beautiful header that I was talking about. Yeah, with the uh, with them on their cell phones and knitting. Um, Lisa, you talked a lot about connection locally, and I'm interested. How are you deciding which decisions you need to get broader consultation? Like you can't have a public meeting. Um, how, how and you've been doing Facebook Live. You've been doing. I know that you've been doubling down on getting information out to people. How do you see the city business now? Uh, for, for, for instance, as we start to talk about reopening. Um, how, what kinds of consultation mechanisms are you going to be able to use to get people's input as you make changes or as serious decisions are about to be made? Thoughts on how you're going to approach that? Well, the uh, Minister of uh, Municipal Government and Housing uh, has been hosting a weekly call with mayors. Uh, she goes section by, so I, we have our mayor's island call on Thursday afternoon. So she indicated that there's going to be a provincial order coming uh, sometime next week with respect to public hearings and how they can be held. Uh, and that, that has to do obviously with land use. Uh, so um, that that's great to have that kind of provincial leadership so that each municipality in British Columbia isn't making up uh, how to hold a public hearing. Yeah. Um, our, our planning staff, we've given them uh, some direction to look at how do we, um, so we have a, a process here in, in Victoria called the Community Association Land Use Committee uh, and all development applications before they, not all, any big rezoning applications before they come into City Hall have to go through the Community Association Land Use Committee before the applicant can be, uh, can submit their application. So we also have a Heritage Advisory Committee because of course you've seen our downtown, it's spectacular and uh, the heritage is really important. Mm -hmm. And we also have an advisory design panel. So staff started with, they started with where are the kinks in the process and how do we uh, fix those in terms of community consultation. So uh, as of yesterday, Heritage, uh, the Heritage panel and the advisory design panel will be meeting online. Uh, the applicants will do their presentations, the staff will be there, uh, the, the panel participants will be there. So that's sorted. Uh, staff have met with the Urban Development Institute and the Community Association Land Use Committee chairs to figure out how do we keep development moving uh, while having public participation. So staff are going to bring us a report back in a couple of weeks and then the public hearing piece will be solved by the province. So it, the reason that land use is so important, uh, there are two reasons. One is construction uh, has been declared an essential service. So that means people can keep working. And what that means is that when those restaurants and retail shops reopen, they'll have some ready customers who have money in their pockets who've been working this whole time. And mm -hmm. the more construction we can have, the better. Uh, secondly, uh, in, the, uh, in the hopper, we've got a lot of rental buildings and a lot of affordable buildings that I don't want to see held up. And so- They're in, they're in, the, they're in your pipeline. They're in, they're in our pipeline at, at various stages. And you, so- Is anybody thinking about whether there'll be some kind of uh, social procurement commitment to the, I mean, we know we're going to, there's obviously going to be federal stimulus money to try to boost more of this infrastructure. We're particularly focused on main streets uh, across the country. You know, yes, you suggest you have several absolutely fabulous main streets and if main streets don't come back, it has a ripple effect. Um, do you think there's some way to ensure that, or are you, maybe you're already, your, your staff may already be thinking about this, about getting procurement tied to local employment, for instance? Absolutely. So Mary, before you hopped on the pre-call this morning, I was, we, and I'll post it again here for everyone. So we've got an amazing initiative here on Vancouver Island. It's four years old. It's called the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative. And there are 21 local governments across the island who are working together to uh, exactly on that. How do we use our money to employ vulnerable people? How do we use our money to buy local? Uh, and we were featured on a national webinar a couple days ago um, on this, this same platform on Zoom. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I posted the link, your staff can share it with you. But um, if people want to learn more about what we're doing, so it was myself and the mayor of Tofino 
Uh, there was a procurement person from uh, Calgary on the on our panel, yeah. uh, and then um, Christy Mater from Scale Collaborative here, who's who's running the the CCSBI. So, what's uh, the? Can you just say the initiative more slowly so that some of us can hear. Yeah. So, her, so it's the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative. I'll just put it all, I know someone told me not to type during this, but I'm typing, so I'm no, breaking the type. rules. Got to break the rules to get things done. There that we would, go. That would be great. The CC, yeah. that's great. Because I, again, I think there's a question of as we recover, who's going to benefit, right? You know um, what, actually before, we go sorry, before we leave this topic, um, CCSPI is a membership uh, uh, oriented organization. So it, basically uh, people have to pay for, for service, but um, we've op we're hosting a webinar next, uh, I'll put the details in there uh, next uh, week uh, on the 28th. And we're, we're opening up to everyone uh, anywhere across the country about how do we use social procurement as part of the COVID recovery. So um, I'll, I'll post the link to that, uh, that webinar. And if anyone's interested, or if you guys want to promote it, uh, it's, it's free and open to everyone and will be hosted by CCSPI. You know, all the federal government initiatives to support business, and there was one that's being announced today on rent. The concern, of course, is that that money will be sucked up largely by big businesses that have the capacity to apply and work at a certain scale. And how do we actually have any kind of trickle down to make sure that much smaller businesses, more modest businesses, and particularly in Main Street retail, which are often family owned. And I mean, there are some chains, but there's lots of independent. Yeah. There's there's actually a couple of answers to that. Um, the community micro lending here in Victoria teamed up with the Downtown Victoria Business Association and they're hosting two webinars, one next Monday and one next Wednesday for exactly that. They're going to have a lawyer, an accountant, an HR professional so that's really small businesses can ask, okay, I'm having this problem. I need this access. So it, the, again, it, our business community has been tremendous in terms of the initiatives they've put together. Um, if the chat function does stay open for a little while after this call, I will... Uh, I'll put that to those webinars up because I mean they're oriented towards Victoria, but no reason anyone from across the country can't join. You must be one of the most dedicated mayors in the country, uh, Lisa. You're willing to stay on after the hour and put some stuff into the chat. We think well, actually at at, at ten o'clock, I've got our our call with our business leaders, so I might be doing double duty. I'll be on the phone uh, chairing that call and putting some things in the or chat. You can, you can also send us the link subsequently, and we'll post them. Okay, so, perfect. Uh, so let me ask you another, just a, a question around broader connections. So you're doing tons of connection with your local stakeholders and all the different components of, 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 uh, of Victoria life. But talk to me about how much contact you're having with other mayors, uh, because there seems to be a growing consensus across the country. And uh, just chat to us about that. How have you, how have you been interacting with other mayors? And then, of course, we want to hear how you're interacting with, with the premier and with the provincial government in BC. So can you describe for us how, what that looks like? Sure. Um, it's very interesting to be the, the mayor of the city of Victoria because while we're on an island and kind of oriented north and south on the island, um, we, we have much more in common with other cities in the country than we do with other uh, cities on, on Vancouver Island or other towns and cities on Vancouver Island. Uh, having said that, um, the, the relationships that I have on Vancouver Island are, are critically important. The, the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative, as I said, was started by mayors. Uh, and so those, we've been, we've been kind of checking in in that way. Um, we also, uh, I, I love my colleagues here in the region. We have, uh, the mayors in the region here have lunch uh, once a quarter. Obviously, we can't have lunch now. So we've moved to uh, bi-weekly Zoom meetings. Uh, and we actually did our first one just uh, earlier in the week. And it was tremendous to see all their heads in the screen, you know, talking about what's working, what's not, what are your challenges. And that's very regional. We're, we're a small region with lots of mayors. Uh, and so that's been very useful on a, on a regional level. Are you opening your parks? Okay, should we open our park? You know, those, those really kinds of, um, seem like small things, but it really has to do with how are we taking care collectively of the well-being of our residents. Uh, and then uh, in terms of mayors across the country, uh, at this point, my closest interactions have been with Kennedy Stewart, uh, the mayor of Vancouver. Um, uh, we're in touch regularly. My chief of staff is regularly in touch with his chief of staff uh, on a number of issues. Uh, and then in, in terms of any further than that, 
um, I can't wait to lift my head up a little bit more uh, and and make some of those uh, connections across the country. Um, Maureen actually said that the librarian that you interviewed yesterday said that it was really useful for her to have her colleagues together across the country and hear some of their different challenges. So. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, Victoria is not part of the Big City Mayor's Caucus. Uh, it's a real bone of contention. We've tried everywhere we can to get into that uh, table, but we're not. They won't let us. So um, that, that so is a bit of a... It's about numbers, I guess, eh? It's just about actual population. Yeah, it's about actual population. But, you know, this is interesting. I, I, uh, I am the mayor of Victoria. I'm not the mayor of Saanich or Esquimalt or anywhere else. But to anywhere else in the country or in the world, you know, I got an offer today from uh, somewhere in Switzerland wanting to help uh, some business here in Victoria. Well, it wasn't here in Victoria. I'm going to connect them anyway, but um, so. Yeah, I mean, as you suggest, I mean, this is larger conversation about how we actually organize what's the unit of governance that's the right unit, because as you suggest, you're part of a region. The same is true of all of the cities that uh, uh, that are really part of economic regions. You know, we probably have six of them in Canada that ha function like a region, and they may involve four or five municipalities, or in the case of the Greater Toronto Area, you know, it's more than two dozen municipalities that actually comprise a region. So, well, it's interesting. Different. Yeah, our, our economic region is actually the Cascadia region. It's British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. So that's how we're, we're oriented uh, more north-south economically. Not entirely, but, uh, but certainly that. Anyways, that is completely off topic. Yeah, no, no, but I mean, it's part of the it's part of the reality, though, as we move forward. I think in terms of thinking about the sustainability of urban regions, um, and I'm interested, as you suggest, that the even though maybe uh, even though Victoria may not be technically part of the Big City Mayor's Caucus, presumably their advocacy to the federal government uh, for a, a response will have some spillover to you, hopefully. Absolutely. Well, and and the other thing that we have uh, in Victoria, and I worked very hard on this in the last uh, the last federal term, and 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 this are, we have a very good direct relationship with Ottawa. I mean, I, I'm in regular contact with Mona Forche, who's the Minister of Middle Class Prosperity. Um, we have we have access to the to the Prime Minister's office on a regular basis, and and we feel very listened to by Ottawa and very consulted by Ottawa, and that feels great. So let's talk a bit about, you know, the stimulus investment and what that might look like. And I see that actually we have a former minister um, who's now, who just put a question on the chat. I don't know if you saw it, Lisa. Uh, minister So, he just asked a question um, about energy retrofits and whether or not are we going to be able to see uh, as we emerge from this, can we go greener? Will we be able to have different kind? Will we have a different incentive because we ha have a kind of colliding uh, crises, COVID and climate? Mm -hmm. and do you think a mo is this a moment? It's a moment. It is a big moment. And every signal that I see coming out of Minister McKenna's office is that that is the direction they're going to go. Uh, there was a great article. And again, I, I will send it to you after the fact that it was from the Pembina Institute, I think in 2018, but somebody reposted it recently and it talked about Canada's next big mega project. And it was about uh -huh. home retrofits, home retro, a beautiful way to frame home retrofits. So uh, buildings, transportation and waste, th those are the greatest sources of carbon pollution and, and greenhouse gas emissions uh, in every city. Uh, buildings, transportation and waste, the ratios change depending on what city you're in. For us, it's 50% buildings, 40% transportation and 10% waste. Uh, that's where uh, all uh, infrastructure and recovery money should go into the projects that address uh, greenhouse gas emissions because uh, the, the normal that we were in wasn't working. Uh, we need a new normal. We're, we're calling it here. I'm thinking of it not only as recovery, but recovery and reinvention. Uh, uh -huh. how, do we, how do we reinvent our cities um, to meet uh, all of the crises that, uh, that we were in before uh, COVID hit? So, so can I ask you about a specific crisis? I mean, you've had an affordable housing crisis in, in Victoria, even though you're small. You've got a lot of people that want to live there and a lot of expensive real estate. And what do you think about, is there an opportunity to change that dial? I mean, you said you have a lot of affordable in the pipeline. That's why you want to get keep construction going. But do you think there needs to be other kinds of interventions to get a, a different kind of mix of housing more affordable in Victoria? Thoughts on that? I don't think there needs to be different interventions. I just think there needs to be more money. So we've got a great program here. It's called the Regional Housing First Program. Uh, we got we set aside $30 million of our own money as a region, not the city. Uh, it was matched by uh, province and Ottawa. So we've got $90 million. We've now raised another 10. The province has committed another 10. We're looking for another 10 from Ottawa. 
$120 million. We'll be build 2,000 units of, of rental housing. Um, 400 of those will rent at 375 a month, which is the shelter rate. Uh, the program was actually mentioned in the federal budget a couple years ago. We got a shout out. I think it was in the 2019 budget. Uh, this is a program that could be replicated across the country. There's no ongoing operating subsidy needed because the shelter rate units at 375 are subsidized by the near market units that rent at about 85% of market. Um, it's it's a it's a boilerplate program. Uh, all, all it needs is, and I, I, you know, we're, we're good. We've got, hopefully we'll have $120 million here. Um, but this is a program that could be replicated very easily city after city after city. What it needs is federal funding to, uh, to build the units. Federal well, provincial. Yeah, federal. so I, I want to ask you a question about vulture capital, but, but, and whether or not you think there's a risk that private uh, sources might come in and buy up stuff, you know, I mean, I, I wonder about that from, Main streets, and I wonder about that. For, you know, if you if we've got projects, for instance, that are maybe won't be able to go forward. You know, are there some companies that will go bankrupt and won't be able to continue? And is there a concern that the financialization of housing will get even worse? Well, but there is an opportunity for the federal government to step in, and 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 you should talk to our mutual friend Adam Vaughn about this. You know, if there are if there are developments that are in that situation, the federal government should either swoop in. He he's he's talking about setting up some separate crown corporate. I, I don't know. Anyways, he's always got these big ideas. But uh, but I, I think that there's a real opportunity. So all of these all of these buildings that we're building will either be owned by the Capital Regional Housing Corporation, which is a publicly owned housing corporation, which I chair, and I've been very pushy about that, uh, as well as uh, by by nonprofit organizations. So that 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 is again, it's an opportunity if if money needs to flow for stimulus, and there are developments that may not go ahead that were privately owned. It's a great opportunity for the federal government through CMHC and others to step in. Uh, with again going back to the local consult the local figure out who the local nonprofits are the local housing corporations buy those up and 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 keep them and or turn them public i mean you again you guys have been good experimenters about this around land trusts and around different kinds of ways to actually support and stimulate local economies and so as you suggest we do it does feel like we're at a bit of a fork in the road doesn't it you know it does are absolutely we, are we going to be able to channel and turn and double down on local or are we going to end up being in a situation where people will be so quick to expedite everything that will revert to something that wouldn't be as sustainable. Let, let's talk about federal money for a minute. Um, the FCM came out yesterday with a pretty bold uh, uh, proposal around a significant uh, financial um, reimbursement from the federal government to, to municipalities based on the gas tax and other kinds of provisions. What mm -hmm. and now and and I think that this is this is basically to try to prevent municipalities from going into deficit or actually being able to have to see services because they're going to be virtually bankrupt. What's your reaction to that? And then let's talk about what the longer term implications might be. Well, I think that FCM uh, put forward a good proposal. Um, when the Prime Minister was asked about it a couple of days ago in his morning address, he, he kind of deferred to the provinces to work with, with local governments. Um, but but the gas tax the gas tax is a perfect model. It was it's a very wise one for FCM to, to seize on that that distribution channel is already there. It's already a direct connection. Uh, so uh, I hope that uh, that the federal government looks very seriously at that. Um, I, I do think that there is a responsibility you know between the provincial government uh, and the municipal government. What we need is a rewriting of Canadian federalism, quite frankly. Yeah, but you get on that. Uh, get on that, would you? Yeah, right. I can't do it from this position, Mary. But um, but, uh, uh, but as we've seen, in not only here, but also with the climate crisis, the, the cities are on the front lines. We're, we're the ones who are, I don't want to say the most creative. There's a lot of creativity in lots of levels of government, but we can, we, we're the most nimble for sure. Uh, we're the most tuned in with what uh, the local needs are. Uh, and, and, and this is the importance of the Canadian Urban Institute. The local needs in Victoria may be different than the local needs in Halifax or Winnipeg or Toronto uh, or Moncton, but there's, there's that thread that can be woven through. So um, mm -hmm. I think I, I'm, I'm optimistic that we're gonna see a lot of money coming for climate. Uh, hopefully the federal money for the uh, housing strategy will roll out. Uh, what I'm not optimistic about is that we'll see a rewriting of Canadian federalism coming out of uh, COVID, but um, one can always hope. Well, it's interesting, you know, I was asked about it earlier in the week and someone said, well, you know, this, the municipalities want a bailout. 
And I said, well, wait, 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 wait. I said, you know, wait a second. The municipalities are expected to deliver all these services directly to people. And they don't have, they didn't have the resources to start off with. Often the duties that they're tasked with are things that they don't have resources for. They're constrained in terms of what tools they have to raise resources. And we as taxpayers need to be concerned about that. We need to be concerned that we can't hold the level of government closest to us that's responsible for service. We can't hold them responsible, accountable for delivering it because they don't have enough money to do it. So this is a pre-COVID challenge. And the question is for people like you, uh, Lisa, is whether we can, do we have to insist on a constitutional change or is there some other kind of mechanism, some creative, mecha some creative government me mechanism that Canada could dream up and think about? Well, it was dreamed up here actually in British Columbia in 2012 uh, through the UBCM. There was a report called Strong Fiscal Futures, and it laid out uh, a very solid plan for the devolution of both uh, authority and revenue to cities in British Columbia. It was, I would say, I would call it a modest proposal, uh, but it's gone nowhere. So there's a, we were supposed to have a BC Mayor's Caucus meeting uh, in Whistler on May the 5th to dust off Strong Fiscal Futures and, and uh, try to revive it. So we may have, you know, 50 or 100 mayors on, on Zoom trying to sort that out. But yeah, the, the, the solutions are there in terms of addressing uh, the uh, lack of power and authority for local government. Um, it's, it's, but we have no power or authority to change those without, um, without uh, consent from the province. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting as we, as we emerge and people realize all the things that are important to them, all the things that make their lives work, you know, parks, uh, access to their local library, community centers, being housing. able to go to the street. Hmm? Housing. Housing, a place to live. A place um, to live. A place to live. Oh yeah, that. Uh, you know, being able to have access to the amenities around them, being able to have some choice, being able to get around. Uh, so much of this is actually under municipal control or certainly most people have no idea, you know, who's responsible for housing. They know oh, exactly. that. You know? and, and, and we're not that, that that that's my point. We're not responsible for housing, but I can't. I've received about you know a thousand emails in the past week asking me to house everyone in Topaz Park and on Pandora. Yeah. Okay. Give 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 us the resources. We could do it. We know how to do this work. Well, and I think so often what's been happening is municipal folks have just been improvising. Well, of course you're going to do, you're not going to say, oh, well, where's the checkbook? Like you just go do it, right? And then that's when I was responding to that journalist and say, what do you mean bailout? The cities are on the front lines of these services. They've been instinctively reacting and responding and dealing with their coordinates and getting the resources out because they have a workforce and they have trucks and they have <laughs> service, you know, they have people to do it. So they've been doing it. And, uh, it's just really interesting to see how do we have to then recalibrate the flow of financial resources when you see who actually has got the capacity to deploy. You guys well, have exactly, and and I know we're running out of time, and we're, now we're kind of on a rant about Canadian federalism. But one one of the things that I think, uh, you know, again. I, I think at least when, when strong fiscal futures uh, originally came out, the, the provincial government at the time, I think that the sense was that they would kind of lose something by handing over, um, you know, uh, more revenue and, and more authority to local governments. But but my my feeling, and I think the feeling of mayors here in British Columbia is actually we're taking some of the burden away from you. We're like it, you're not losing. We're we're, we're so it. it I think there's a lot of potential. Anyways, we'll see. We'll have our, our virtual mayor's caucus and see what we can come up with. You know, the first, the fact that we're actually able to, that, that some legwork is being done, that there's been, there've been a lot of people thinking and talking about this for a couple of decades, right? I mean, and we're talking about a constitution that's hundreds of years old, so not quite, but you know. It's 1867, that's where we got our powers. A lot has changed in the world since 1867. <laughs> I know, and you know, the, the Canadian Urban Institute's 30 years old, and I often say that I've just come in as the CEO in the fall, and I say, you know, cities are, we're at a different level of awareness of what cities are in, in Canada, what the meaning of the urban settlement form is for Canadian, for Canadians as, as a whole, and it's for, certainly for the Canadian economy. We're at a different level of awareness, even now, 30 years later than when COI was founded. So this may be the moment, and I don't want us to shy away from those tough conversations, and we absolutely are going to have conversations about how do we, how do we re- organize and re you know just reassess how we actually provide resources because i think we as individuals want to have the best service and we want to have the best places and so as you suggest who's the right level to do it and who's the right level to pay for it yeah all right now listen lisa we can't have you here on a national program without talking about something very important What's which that? is bonnie henry yes 
and John Fluvog making a shoe, the Bonnie Henry. This is a, I love these little things that emerge from these crises and yeah. there's a local hero and a local uh, a craftsman shoe designer has made a shoe after. Now, are you gonna get a pair of Bonnie Henry's? Well, I do not wear pink high heels, as you might imagine. <laughs> <laughs> But I can tell you that at 4 p.m. yesterday, when the shoes went on sale, the website immediately crashed. So that I can tell you that it did. So Josie, Josie, Josie Osborne, who's the mayor of Tofino, we were on a call with Minister Robinson at this point. And I, I, I think this is light enough that I can share. So Josie was trying to order the shoes uh, while we were on the call. She mentioned when she got to ask the minister a question like, Minister, can you fix the Fluvog site? Jokingly. And the minister said, well, you know, I've got my husband right now at home standing on trying to get these. So I can guarantee that there'll be at least one mayor and one minister in British Columbia who will be sporting the Bonnie Henry Fluvog. Uh, I will not be one of them, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a great story. You know, it's 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 it is striking. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, uh, we're both women, and we're going to obviously nod our heads. But it is striking how so many of the public figures and the heroes and the trusted figures that are emerging in this narrative are women, uh, because of the, I guess because public health has been a career path for women for years, and there are many of them that are at the senior ranks and. Uh, and maybe it's just important for us to take a moment and appreciate that, that leadership emerges. And Lisa, you are an exemplar of uh, local leadership and demonstrating to people um, what it means to actually be a mayor who's committed on the, on the ground, but also uh, has the capacity to advocate on behalf of her residents uh, in, uh, around the country. So uh, we're very appreciative that you took the time to be with us today. And uh, just know both Lisa and I are wearing red because today is red day. Uh, the uh, uh, Nova Scotians have asked us all to wear red uh, as a recognition of Heidi, the RCMP officer who lost her life earlier in the week in that horrible tragedy with 21 others. And so that's why we're both wearing red. And we're both wearing our SDG pin. What happened to yours? We did both. It's right here. Our, yeah. This is our sustainable, sustainable development. Sustainable development goals. There we are. Yeah. Never leave home without it. Really, exactly. So. You know, the, the, the discussion continues. The future of urban Canada is at stake. We need a roadmap for recovery, which is what the Canadian Urban Institute is going to focus on. with and, re and reinvention. Recovery and reinvention. I know, I know. I heard it. And reinvention. Recovery and reinvention. Thank you for that. Lisa, thank you for joining us. Sydney My Tom, pleasure. It will be posted online. You'll be able to see Mayor Helps' uh, discussion and the chat will be up over the weekend and then we start next week uh, and we have more of these conversations including one on what's the future of municipal finance. Uh, we've also got an all youth panel to talk about young people and what they're coming to terms with and how they see their city. Um, and then we have another mayor who will, who will be a surprise for people who will <laughs> join us next week. So the conversation continues. Thank you again, Mayor Helps for joining us and thanks everybody for tuning in and I hope you have a restful weekend. Thanks. Okay. Bye.